But even frequent flyers packed into the belly of a 400-ton metal bird don't really understand how it works. We are propulsion and some airlift, and... I'm pre-med, so you think that after all the physics classes, I would know something, but... I don't know what to do with the wing design. The gust of air shooting up, I guess. The wind, I think, or coming down, I'm not sure which way. I would just assume uh, random air currents, I really don't know. I think the plane goes fast enough to get enough air through the engine. The propellers make it go up and down. Jet. I can't remember, the wing is fatter at the front and then it streamlines out. The air lifts it. Okay, air's always important. It's pretty impressive that it all works. Every time I get up there, I think, how in the world is this happening? He's not the only one. Okay, so I hope the last guy's not the pilot. So, a couple of things about this. What generates the left? And what generates the thrust for these airplanes? was killed in more than 100 hurt yesterday when the United Airlines jet traveling from Japan to Hawaii suddenly took a big dive. 11 of those injured are still in the hospital tonight. Correspondent Bob Orr reports. <laughs> United Airlines Flight 826 was cruising six miles above the dark Pacific when the bottom fell out. This whole video, taken just seconds after the Boeing 747 was jolted by turbulence, shows people with head injuries, dangling oxygen masks, and luggage, food trays, and seat cushions strewn about the cabin. The jumbo jet with 393 people on board was nearly a third of the way from Tokyo to Honolulu. At about 33,000 feet, without warning, the plane hit a pocket of turbulence so severe, it plunged 1,000 feet in a matter of seconds. Unbuckled passengers and flight attendants who were in the process of serving dinner were slammed headfirst into overhead luggage bins. I went through the ceiling, said this battered passenger. I was panicked, said another. People were crying everywhere. The jetliner with 100 injured, a dozen seriously, turned back to Tokyo. Dazed and heavily bandaged passengers walked off the plane. Others were carried. The paramedics worked feverishly, but without success, to revive one Japanese woman who died of head injuries. While turbulence is a common occurrence, deaths and serious injuries are rare. Since 1981, major U.S. airlines have reported 252 incidents of severe turbulence. More than 800 people have been hurt, but only 63 of them seriously. And including last night's fatality, only three deaths. Virtually all of the injured and killed were not wearing seatbelts. Veteran pilot Rick Husted says too many Okay, so <clears throat> what do we know? We know that the airplane was falling faster than passengers inside, right? Passengers were falling under the influence of gravity, and then the airplane is being pushed down by forces generated within the air turbulence. So the question is, how did the airplane... How, how did it get pushed down with a force which is larger than the gravitational force? How did the force come about? So that's one of the things that we're going to investigate. EDs, as they are called, were first developed after World War II by the Air Force to test ejection seats, or as in this footage, for pressurized cabin tests. So if a portion of the airplane goes missing, you get sucked out. Why? A lot of you guys are thinking you're, you're going to get sucked out because the side is pressurized, and obviously if it, portion of the airplane goes missing because of pressure difference you're going to get sucked out that's correct that the inside is pressurized but the pressure difference between the inside and outside large is not large enough for you to get sucked out so what causes the additional pressure difference if a portion of the airplane goes missing yeah you will get sucked out so the question is why well, former race car driver mario andretti involved in a really dramatic crash while testing a car at indianapolis motor speedway wednesday andretti going over 200 miles an hour when he hit debris on the track he walked away from this wreckage but did get checked out of the tracks hospital he is unhurt andretti 63 years old retired from racing but he was helping his son michael out by testing a car for his racing team and mike he talked to reporters afterwards said he was fine but it was a wild experience he didn't want anyone to think because of his age that it might have had anything to do with it he said there was just no time to react no yellow light that nobody could have done anything about it but he landed right side up so it Thank really made a big Difference. Yeah, he's like you said, he hit a solid chunk of debris going, what, 225? That's what an Indy cars were qualifying, so he still got it. So for the first time in nine years, he's back in the car, and that's what happens. But he may get back in. Yeah. Okay, so... Well, well former race car driver Mario... Why did, the air, why did the car become airborne? Just like that. What happened? Speaking of race cars... As Ayrton sent across the... Senna is kind of like Senna was like Michael Jordan of race car driving. Trying to start the seventh lap of the San Marino Grand Prix, he was in pursuit of his fourth world title. As so often was the case, he was in the lead, traveling at 190 miles per hour. A computer on board his Williams FW16 registered the start of a new lap and began to record the 12.8 seconds of data that would tell the story of how Ayrton Senna died. Okay, so how did he die? That would tell the start of a new hour. A computer on board his Williams FW16 registered the start of it. A... Lost control of his car. New lap. In one of the turns. The race cars can handle those car turns like five times faster, four or five times faster than commercial cars. And began to record the. Tw so the question is this given the fact that the mass of the weight of a car doesn't matter in terms of how fast you negotiate a curve, how is it that the race cars can negotiate at a faster speed? 
It's about four times faster than the commercial cars. 12.8 seconds of data. That we and obviously, when he was negotiating a curve like that, a turn like that, he lost control of the car. So I'll cause that. Thing. Tell the story. And then a freak accident took place, lost his life. All right. The least interesting of all the questions that I'm asking. I've been asking all throughout the semester is this one. All right. Just that the water, how many of you guys noticed that the water is running down from a faucet? It gets thinner. What caused that to happen? And why is this question even important? It's important enough because we ever thought of it. It's been the same guy who came up with the design of a rocket. All right. So the explanation that works here is the reason why we have jet engines as well as the rocket. Right. So notice that the, as the water is running away from the faucet, it's running down away from the faucet. Notice that it gets thinner. So the question is why. So actually closed holes. Notice that the water is going to come out running faster. Why? What's your theory on that? I'm going to give you guys two more seconds on this one. This one, this one is straightforward. I'm hoping that some of you guys have an answer. So when you partially close the holes, the water is going to come out running faster. So the question is why? Most of you guys are thinking what? Most of you guys are thinking that the water is going to come out running faster because I kind of know the pressure. I like give yourself five pounds for that one. Yeah, that's one explanation. Most of you guys will say that you're, you know, you're increasing the pressure, right? That's the reason why the water is going to come out faster. Okay, the other explanation that some of you guys may be thinking it's a little bit more involved than just dropping a word is, you know, the, vol the volume of water is not compressible, right? You cannot compress water. So when you squeeze the water into a smaller opening, naturally it's going to speed up. Okay, so there are two ways of looking at it. You can say, well, you know, when you reduce the opening, size of the opening, when you reduce the size of the opening, you, you're just increasing the pressure. And that's the reason why the water is running out faster. The second way of looking at it is you cannot compress water. You cannot compress the volume of water. So, which means that if you squeeze it into a smaller opening, naturally, it's going to come out even faster. So, which explanation? Which explanation works? All right. So, which means that we have to switch. Yeah, I thought this presentation was ready to go. You know, you know. All right. Something that I just gave you is called the constancy of the mass flow rate. All right. So, the constancy of the mass flow rate. So, you got this bottleneck contraption. This is the volume of the fluid going in. And the same volume of the fluid has to come out. All right, so you, if it's an incompressible fluid, like water, it doesn't need to be incompressible, but it makes it easier to think of. So, which means that if you squeeze the fluid into a smart opening, it's simply going to speed up. That's what it means. Right, so, the amount of, amount of fluid that goes in and comes out of any contraption has to be the same. The volume of the fluid going in and coming out of any contraption is going to be the same. So, which means that some have the same volume, if you squeeze it into a smart opening, it's simply going to speed up. All right, so, this is known as the constancy of the mass flow rate. So the volume of the fluid going in and coming out will be the same. Okay. If it's water, the densities will be the same. If it's air, you can change the air density. You can make it hotter or you can make, make some combustible materials inside, as you will find out. So the combination of density, velocity, and area is going to remain constant. So that's known as the constancy of the mass flow rate. All right. So the density, the area, and the volume of the incoming fluid and the outgoing fluid will be the same. All right. So what's the interpretation of this? Simple interpretation is the following. Okay. Let's get up here. So given the fact that this multiplication of these terms will remain constant, what happens if you reduce the size of the opening, the fluid is going to speed up. All right, so for a constant density in this case, because it makes the argument easier. All right, so if the density is assumed constant, it doesn't need to be constant. All right, so if you reduce the size of the opening, the fluid is going to speed up. So otherwise known as the constancy of the mass flow rate. Applications are plenty. Blast of hot gases out of... Okay, I'd probably stop this a little bit too soon. Okay. Let me check to see if there is more. Oh, the application of this cute, simple application. All right, so what looks like meaningless conjecture? It's not. Okay, so the fluid is speeding up, right, in this direction. What that means is it's accelerating. You know the acceleration is caused by a force. So this becomes the action force acting on the fluid. And you know the forces will come in pairs, So which means that for every single action force, there's going to be an equal and opposite reaction force. So the reaction force is going to act on this vessel, the contraption. All right, so which means that you push the fuel in this direction or the fluid in this direction or the gas in that direction, in turn, the object, the mass of what's being ejected is going to apply the same force back on this vessel in the opposite direction. What I just described to you is known as a jet engine or a rocket. All right, so that's how the jet a blast engine. of hot gases out of the end of a metal tube, one of the simplest ideas for an engine in history. <laughs> Any child who's ever blown up a balloon, then released it to zoom through the air as it deflates, has seen how jet power works. The most common form of jet engine today is the turbojet. It uses spinning compressor wheels at the front end of the engine to compress the incoming air. The air is then mixed with fuel and ignited. The blast of exhaust gases out the back propels the engine forward, as well as rotating turbine wheels at the back, which turn the front compressor wheels on the same shaft. 
Okay, so it's the same design. We've got the bottleneck shape. We've forced the air into a smart opening. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna speed up. On top of that, obviously they ignite air and everything else, so which means that they also change the density. When the density goes down, once again, it's gonna speed up. So you reduce the size of the opening, it's, the air is gonna speed up. On top of that, you lower the density, it's also gonna speed up. Notice that you make it hotter at that point. All right, so which means that you reduce the density of quite a bit. So which means that the air in this direction is just gonna speed up, air is accelerating in this direction. What that means is there's a force acting on the air. So that becomes the action force. The action force is acting on the air. Reaction force is gonna act on the jet engine. And so the reaction force is what propels the airplane in the opposite direction. The main difference. Rockets work the same principle. difference between the two is that the jet engine uses oxygen in the air for its combustion, while the rocket carries oxygen on board for its combustion. That makes the rocket engine heavier, but allows it to operate outside the Earth's atmosphere. All right, so. The main difference between the two. Kind of the same principle. If you cut into the inside of a rocket, once again, you got your fuel, you got oxygen, everything else. You got this nozzle shape, bottleneck shape, once again. So you reduce the density of the air because of the fuel. On top of that, the size of the opening is significantly reduced. As a result, this rocket fuel and the oxygen, the combination is gonna speed up, accelerate. There's a force acting on it. So the reaction force is gonna act on the rocket. And then you end up getting the acceleration that you desire. Consequently, all right. But in water, you're gonna get thinner. Or it's gonna neck down. That's the expression that we use. So the question is why? Uh, the reason why that happens is that water is running away from the faucet. As it's running away from the faucet, it's obviously accelerating under the influence of gravity. And it's speeding up. Water surface tension is gonna keep water together. Water part of the part is I'm just gonna say it's just gonna keep the water together. And so the water is gonna get thinner and thinner and thinner. So the surface tension is gonna keep it together. At some point, it's gonna become so thin that obviously water is gonna go into droplets. Okay, so this is another example of the constancy of the mass flow rate. So in this case, faster it goes, the thinner it's gonna become, which means that the cross-sectional area is gonna get smaller. All right, so constancy of the mass flow rate, let's take a look at two examples. Um, one is the jet engine, this is problem number one. Okay, so it's got an intake area, it's gonna be five square meters. Output nozzle is gonna be one square meter. All right, so the density of the compressed air is just before. All right, so it's density of the compressed air actually is compressed air before the combustion is. Remember guys, the air density is 1.29. So this is, it, it, it's a mixture of some kind of fuel in the air. So it's gonna be two kilograms per cubic meter. And then what happens is you end up reducing the density. So two things which are gonna get reduced. Size of the opening, you're gonna get reduced. So that's gonna to to make the air go faster. Also the density is reduced once the air is ignited. So what's the exit speed from the jet engine in comparison to the initial speed? All right, so here's the constancy of the mass flow rate. So that's the equation we get to use. All right, so we want to know how fast the air is moving in comparison to its initial speed. So we have to look at its ratio. Right, the first of it is straightforward algebra. Follow the rules of algebra. If you make a mistake, go back and correct it. All right, so we get numbers for the density as well as the area as proof. All right, so use the numbers and it means that you're able to speed up by 20 times. So the exit speed of the air is gonna be 20 times larger than input speed. All right, so the next example is running water. All right, so we are dealing with a stream of water coming from a faucet, so it's gonna get thinner. So that's the reason why we say it next down. So the water is gonna emerge from a faucet at two meters per second. That's gonna follow short distance. The speed is gonna increase to three meters per second because of the gravitational acceleration. All right, so how much will this cross-sectional area be reduced as a result? So what's the ratio of the size of the area in comparison to the initial size? All right, so speeds up the influence of gravity, the running water, it goes from two meters per second to three meters per second. So how much thinner does it get as it's moving away from the fossil? Okay, so once again, we're not using the constancy of the mass flow rate. Right, so we will take a look at the ratio of the final area to the initial area. That's what we need. All right, so algebra is straightforward. So area is gonna get reduced by 66%. All right, so the final area is gonna be 66% of the initial one. That's five points. All right, so we know what generates the thrust for the airplane. So the next question is what generates the left. People were still convinced that they could fly under their own power. Some harnessed the motive power produced by the bicycle, but the result was still the same. 
This was even though some of the machines were remarkably elaborate. Others thought that the secret lay in having sufficient initial height. One man went to the ultimate by using the top of the Eiffel Tower in what can only be supposed was literally a flying suit. But what seemed imaginative in concept proved fatal in practice. But the start of World War I put an end to such frivolous pursuits as human-powered flight. The paddle concept was an interesting one. But in practice, this was a goose doomed never to fly. The bicycle still provided the most likely means of achieving liftoff, but this man gave himself the added burden of having to use his arms to flap his wings. But it was a good muscle toner. This racing cyclist, however, did manage to get off the ground, albeit very briefly. But a controlled landing proved difficult. In the United States, Madame Albertine was certain that she could fly, given enough practice and faith. But the power of the mind was not enough to get herself or her students airborne. Yet perhaps it would work if sufficient takeoff speed could be achieved. Or maybe ski power would do the trick. Or, as this British birdman reckoned, why not use the power of the internal combustion engine for an assisted takeoff? But things did not work out as planned. Okay, so these guys are trying to generate left. Interesting enough, earlier in the early stages of the 20th century, despite the fact that, believe it or not, guys, Daniel Bernoulli is the guy who actually gave us the physics. According to Daniel Bernoulli, the theory goes like that. It's related to the contraption that we were discussing. Notice that you got this bottleneck shape, and you're forcing the fluid into a smaller opening. As a result, what's happening is just speeding up. So the question is this. As the fluid is exiting its nozzle or bottleneck shape through a smaller opening, what happens to the pressure generated by the fluid? Uh, so the fast moving fluid, well, what is the amount of pressure that it's gonna generate at the nozzle as it's exiting? Now, most of you guys will say, uh, as it's exiting, the pressure that it's gonna generate is gonna be larger than input pressure. That's what you guys will say. So this thing is speeding up in that direction. This is speeding up in that direction. You will argue that P2 is gonna be larger than P1. In fact, if it's if it's a hose and if it's partially closed, you will say, "Yeah, definitely." You can almost you can feel the pressure on your finger. So you're thinking that pressure is going to be larger. Reality is just the opposite, guys. As the fluid speeds up, the amount of pressure that it's going to generate is going to be smaller. Okay, guys. Remember, pressure means the amount of force acting on an area, amount of force per unit area. When the molecules are moving in this direction real fast, they don't have a component which is perpendicular to. They don't have a large enough component which is perpendicular to their motion. As a result, the faster they go in this direction, the smaller the pressure that will exert on the boundary, the smaller the pressure that will apply on the boundary. Bernoulli is the one who discovered that. So it's, so it's contrary to your common sense. So the faster the fluid moves, the smaller the pressure that it, it generates. The slower the fluid moves, the larger the pressure that it's going to generate. All right, so he came up with this equation. This is based upon the conservation of energy equation. So remember, one half mb squared kinetic energy term becomes that. The pressure term is going to be related to potential energy. So I'm not doing any derivations at this point. So this is known as the Bernoulli equation. The faster the fluid moves, the smaller the pressure that it generates. The weight is minimal, and the large surface allows it to rise the higher. Okay, so this is a CREATE project done by a bunch of students, maybe about 20 years ago. I noticed that the boom becomes suspended. So the uh, air current stream of air and the air current is being generated by a hair dryer. Okay, so what happens is the inside the stream of air, the air current, faster moving air, is gonna generate a lower pressure. So within the stream, the air pressure is gonna be smaller, the surrounding air pressure. 
the result, the balloon becomes suspended. So faster moving air within the stream is going to generate a smaller pressure, air pressure inside the stream. That's, and there's going to be a pressure difference within inside inside the stream and, or, and then away from the stream. All right, so the, within the stream, the air pressure is going to be lower than the surrounding. Okay. Airplane. Now I'd like everybody to take one of these pieces of paper and hold it in front of them like this. Now blow across the top of it like this. <gasps> Man, I'm not the only one with bad breath in here, I'll tell you that right now. Woo! You see, the paper goes up. The strips of paper go up because the moving air is reducing the pressure along the top surface, but not the bottom, so the paper is lifting. Now I'd like everybody to take one of these pieces of... Okay, so the faster moving air on top is going to generate a lower pressure. So the pressure difference between the top and the bottom of the paper is what generates the left. So the low pressure on top, high pressure at the bottom, low pressure on top because the air is moving faster on top. Bernoulli's principle. This is known as the airfoil test. All right, so this has the shape of an airplane wing. So notice that by design, the air is forced to go faster on top. So the faster moving air on top is gonna to create a lower pressure. All right, so you can see the distance, distances between the streams. All right, so which means that pressure is going to be lower on top. So the air pressure on top is going to be lower than at the bottom. So the pressure difference is what generates, what generates the left. What you do need is to have the top half of the wing curved like this. Now, Ms. Krempel, uh, turn the fan on, please. You see, the air going across the wing has to travel farther over the top of the wing because of the curve. So it goes faster to keep up with the rest of the air. And as it goes faster, it wipes away air pressure from the top of the wing. And so the pressure from beneath the wing forces it up. Right, Professor? Whoa. Yep, that's right. A wing tilted up or down can help. But as we just saw, it's the curve of a wing that is what really keeps it flying. It's the air blowing over the curve of the wing that causes lift. Now look at a jet plane. The wings are level, but the top part of the wing is curved. But what about the wind? I thought the wind pushed the plane into the air from behind. Oh, no, Mr. Savage. In fact, the opposite is true. Planes always take off into the wind. That's to ensure that lots of wind will sweep over the wings and create lift. Thank you, Professor. You know, the same effect is true for water. Planes don't fly underwater. No, but fish do, sort of. Their fins are like wings, with water moving over them instead of air. There are other animals that have figured this out, like the prairie dog, for instance. I love prairie dogs! They build up the entrances to their tunnels like little volcanoes. This forces the air to travel faster over the opening, which reduces the pressure and provides ventilation into their homes. So problem number 15. Let's do this numerically. Let's take a look at the pressure difference between the bottom and the top of the airplane. Okay, so by design, airplanes fly around 550 miles per hour. So by design, the top of the airplane weighing there is moving at 555 miles per hour. And at the bottom, it's moving at 504 miles per hour. Not like that. There's a 50 mile per hour difference between the top and the bottom. All right, so at altitude that they're flying, that's about 30,000 feet up. Air density is not quite 1.29. At that point, it's going to 1.2. So we do the conversions to the metric units. So what's the pressure difference between the top and the bottom? I would expect a reduction in pressure from bottom to the top, from top to the bottom. No, from bottom to the top, there's going to be a reduction in pressure. And how much of a lift does that generate? We know the area of an airplane wing. So, so we're going to be looking at the lift per wing, I guess. All right, so we're interested in the Bernoulli's principle. So that's the Bernoulli's equation. The pressure on top, the speed of the air on top, the pressure at the bottom of the wing, the speed at the bottom of the wing. So look at the pressure difference. All right, so I'm going to subtract the pressure at the bottom from both sides. And then get rid of the velocity term from the left hand side as well as the right hand side. And then I'm going to factor out the common term. So that's one half rho. And that's it. Now we can look at the pressure difference between the top and the bottom. And then we end up getting a negative pressure difference, which means that the pressure at the bottom is going to be larger than the top. All right, so we end up getting a huge pressure difference. Okay, so how much of a lift does that generate? So the pressure is the force divided by an area. All right, so the pressure difference is going to be our pressure. So for the force. And I'm plugging the numbers in. So it's going to give us the lift force in terms of Newtons. So it's going to be 28,000, almost 30,000 pounds per wing. So it's experiencing a 60,000 pounds of left from the wing. So it's got to be the weight of the airplane, if that's the case. Easy this is just for the hell of it. There's an interesting argument discussion here coming up. Ancient cultures experienced reflight hundreds of years ago. I have some strange objects here found in pre-Columbian tombs, dated about 800 to 600 before Christ. Archaeologists believe that these must be insects. Perhaps a part of a pre-Inca cult which revealed insects. 
but when closely examined, these figures don't look like insects at all. Insects have their wings on the top of their bodies. Here, the wings are on the bottom. So what are these strange figures if they are not insects? They look like airplanes. The amulets look like airplanes. Bob Trelease is an expert in the study of early flight. They have the shape, the physical structure. They have the elements that make an airplane as we recognize it today. These ancient figures reminded Bob Trelease of a very specific plane. When I saw the amulet, I immediately associated with the shape of the airplane. The shape matched it. The apparent resemblance between the modern combat jet and the ancient icon is striking. But could it just be a coincidence? When Bob Trelease noticed something else peculiar about the golden figures, he began to wonder what the reality was behind this mystery. The curlicues looked like they could be an engineering representation of turbulent air over the leading edge of the wing. Were our ancestors experimenting with real flights, or perhaps were they expressing some kind of mythology? Could it be both? One possible answer comes from anthropological discoveries made in the 20th century. When one culture with a simple technology comes into contact with a second culture with a more complex technology, people often turn to religion. Anthropologist Dr. Lamont Lindstrom offers one explanation for the existence of these figurines. It may be found in the anthropological concept known as cargo cult. Cargo cult is a South Pacific example of a kind of religious movement that's happened almost every place in the world. Life in the South Pacific prior to World War II was pre-industrial in its simplicity. There was no electricity. There were no roads and no radio. No contact with the outside world. Overnight, World War II brought amazing treasures from distant worlds to these remote islands. Airplanes descended from the sky and opened their doors. Out flowed a deluge of military equipment and technology, which the islanders had never seen before. To them, the radio was a wonder, a magical machine able to speak in many voices. So people who had lived a very simple life for generations over a very short period of time experienced an incredible amount of new technology that just poured across the shore and came into their lives. And then when the war ended, the cargo suddenly disappeared. Desperate to find some way to bring the cargo back, the islanders turned to prayer and religious ritual. Much of the ritual of cargo cult uh, attempts to try to attract the return of whoever controls the cargo. They do things like, uh, in many islands, cut airstrips in the forest, in the jungles, hoping that the planes will land again. They built model planes. Sometimes these are small models, sometimes almost life-size models, and put these planes on the airfield as a kind of imitation of some device that will encourage the cargo planes to land. Using the cargo cult theory, were these gold artifacts created by ancient Indians modeled after mysterious aircraft from long ago? One way to examine this mystery was to see if the amulets were aerodynamically sound and might have been able to fly. Captain Peter Belding, a pilot and air traffic controller, built exact scale models of these icons out of molded plastic. Although it is unknown whether the amulets might represent powered aircraft or gliders, Captain Belding made them self-propelling. He attached a small pop motor to one, and in the other, he placed a turboprop engine. Now Captain Belding tests the more powerful turboprop model. The sight of these models in the sky raises intriguing questions about the icons on which they are based. The idea that they were copied from a working airplane in existence 800 years before the birth of Christ is very difficult to believe. Is it possible Christ is might have been able to fly? Back the return of the cargo cult theory. Were these gold artifacts created and in the other? We can't hear you. 600 to 800 BC, pre Mayan history, right? Supposedly. Okay. So they found this, these gold amulets. And so they make some inferences. They say, so these cannot be insects. And by looking at the design and the shape of it, they decided that if they're based upon real airplane model designs, okay, so which means that they have proper dimensions for, for flight for an airplane. Okay, guys, the first airplane was flown in the United States in 1903 by, by brothers. I, I, I don't know how far they were able to fly. Probably they were able to fly. It was probably the length of a football field. And so 1903, and then World War One starts in, in 1914. And by then, obviously, they had airplanes. and 
they were using it for recognizance, recognizance purposes. World War II, obviously, it was fairly sophisticated. So World War II started in 1939. So it took about 20 to 30 years before we figured out the proper flight characteristics of an airplane. This didn't happen overnight. Okay, so the design that you're looking at, the sort of design is not based on insect design. The insects don't have the sort of flight characteristics that the airplanes do. So they decided to take they decided that these amulets are based upon modern airplane design characteristics. So they end up building these model airplanes and then one of them has a turbojet, the other one is a propeller, I think. I don't know. They were able to get it to work. But both of them have the correct design characteristics that feels about three years to fact. So the question is, what's going on? Okay, so what is that even, even if, okay, let's pretend that their interpretation is correct. Let's pretend that the Mayans came up with this design. What does that mean, as far as you guys are concerned? Does this mean that the pre-Mayans had this technology? Does this mean that we were being visited by space aliens? What does it mean to you guys? Or do you have a better explanation for it? All right, guys, just jump in at the point because I don't have an answer for you. So I'm, I'm just curious about what you guys think. I mean, they, they, they said in the video, they're not sure. Like, they, they might just been really fancy gliders. And I, I feel like we would have found like like some semblance of remnant technology if they had that kind of capability to make such a thing. So I feel like it might be gliders of some sort. OK, that's not, I'm going to give you 10, 20 points for that one. Might be a glider of some sort. Yeah, why not? I like that. Or what else <clears throat> can you guys think of? Um, this guy, I forgot his name. Ancient cultural six figurines. Oh, the amulet line. Um, right, so these are the guys who are coming up with that. Coveries made into associated with the wings are on the bottom. All right, uh, guy, that you're listening to. Life in the station. Aircraft, all the class. Aircraft from another planet load a deluge of military equipment in the world. Or perhaps where they express. Uh, the guy whose voice you're listening to. Some kind of his name is Danakan. Could it be both? One possible answer comes from anthropological discoveries made in the 20th He started publishing books in the late 1960s, early 1970s. His century. One, one. His ancient aliens or whatever on the History Channel Cultural is based upon all his theories. I think this is the same show. The technology comes into a different station. I think some of you guys may know of him. Let me just check the chat. Okay, yeah, I, I completely agree with it. It's, I don't know if it's badly interpreted artifact, but definitely it's something weird. Okay, your mind kind of starts to wonder. So the question, if, if, you, if you're a believer in the UFOs or being visited or whatever, that, this is the sort of stuff that you would be focusing on. And this guy is the guy who always looks at things, oh, are we being visited? So every single artifact, this guy's been looking for science and publishing books. This guy's hugely famous. Obviously, the History Channel has the Ancient Aliens show is based on this culture. guy. My dad is a huge believer in it. With a more complex is, uh, good friends with Danikin, so if they I grew up listening to this sort of stuff. And turned to religion. Personally, I don't care. <laughs> Do I believe in that sort of stuff? Are we being visited? Maybe, maybe not. Who cares? I don't. I personally don't. Apologies. But is, is this the proof of it? Again, news for you guys. No, not necessarily. Evidently, okay. So if you're open to believing in this sort of stuff, that's fine. It doesn't harm anyone. Obviously, you can look at it from that perspective if you want to believe in that sort of stuff. If you want to be comfortable with it. Number one is a gold artifact. So you cannot do carbon dating. It could be fake. All right. Or because it's gold, it's not a living thing. You cannot do carbon dating. If it's not fake, then what's the explanation? One explanation is, yeah, they were being visited by space aliens, and these space aliens obviously knew how to fly, if that's the case, if you want to believe in it. Another, another explanation, of course, if you are a skeptic, you got to start looking for something else. Evidently, the, 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 the rivers around within this area they have fish that kind of look like that. Okay, so the fish is going to have the right flight characteristics. Well. So you can also look at it. From that perspective, well, this is the sort of stuff you can't really conclude. You can debate it any way you want. You're not going to be able to change anybody's mind. But it's stunning that it's got the right flag characteristics for whatever the reason. So, fish or something real, I don't know. They have the technology. Obviously, outside of this, there's no evidence on one. So, who knows? But just wanted to discuss it. So, this guy, this is the guy, Danikin. So, he's the uh, guy who's been publishing books forever. All right, I'll take a break for 10 15, 10 minutes, and then we'll take it from here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the plane in air turbulence. All right, so the plane is falling faster than passengers inside, right? Why? Because by design, the air is forced to go faster on top of the wing. 
it generates a pressure difference between the top and the bottom. So the pressure difference is what generates the lift. So as a result, what happens is the airplane becomes part of the air mass that it's flowing in. Now the air mass is also susceptible to the conditions. So what happens to the air, the wind, around obstacles like the mountains, it just speeds up. Air is going to speed up. So this air stream within which the airplane is flying in, because of the obstacle, what happens is it's going to generate a faster moving air closer to the mountain. As a result, the faster moving air is going to generate a lower pressure here. So this air mass is going to get sucked in the down direction while taking the airplane with it. All right, so that's what happens during turbulence. There's always a turbulence around these mountains. Okay, you will notice it when you're flying to California, for example. The airplane is going to get buffeted when it's going over these high mountains. All right, so the race cars. As strange as it may seem, a machine such as this is not so much a car, but an airplane flying upside down, very, very close to the ground. The simplest aerodynamic device is a wing. On an airplane, the wing's mounted this way round, and the air has to go further around the top surface than the bottom surface, so the air going over the top has to go faster than the air going underneath. Faster air has a lower pressure, so it produces lift. Daniel Bernoulli, a Dutch mathematician, established in the 18th century that the faster air travels, the lower its pressure. This is the fundamental principle behind both how airplanes fly and how Formula One cars stay on the track. On a racing car, we take a wing and put it the other way up, so it produces a force in the downward direction, downforce. Downforce is the holy grail for modern race car designers. It pushes the cars into the track, increasing their grip by as much as a factor of four. While a car's going around the corner, it's, it tries to go straight on. This is a natural law of physics, and the only force you have to prevent the car flying off the road is the grip provided by the tires. With all things being equal, a car with four times its own weight in downforce will be able to corner four times faster than one with no downforce at all. As strange as it may seem, a machine such as... <clears throat> all right, so Bernoulli's principle is used. Except by design, when you turn it upside down, the air is forced to go faster underneath. Right, so it's going to generate a lower cr pressure under the vehicle, per se. So there's going to be a downforce. Downforce is going to be four times the weight of the vehicle. Remember, guys, four times the weight of the vehicle is going to end up generating a four times the normal force. The apparent weight is going to go up. Remember, the frictional force is proportional to the apparent weight. So, which means that these cars will experience a friction, which is going to be four times larger than the commercial cars, which means that you can negotiate a curve four times faster. That's what it means. Commercial cars without going into your skin. The cruel irony is that in the relentless search for cornering performance through aerodynamics, the cars have become dangerously unstable. With the regulations that were in practice at the time of Eden's crash, the car had to run very, very close to the ground. And we're talking here about this far above the ground. We're not talking about road car type figures of inches. We're talking about millimeters. The reason that this distance, called the ride height, was so slim was due once again to the basic physical principle that fast air creates low pressure. The designer tries to get maximum possible velocity of air underneath the car because that way he generates low pressure and sucks the car to the ground. The faster the air can be made to travel under the car, the lower its pressure, just as the Bernoulli principle dictates. Because the way to get the air to travel very fast is to minimize the ride height. The smaller the gap, the faster the air has to travel to squeeze through. A very low car means very high downforce. The problem comes as the car gets lower and lower and lower, the velocity gets higher and higher, you get more and more downforce. Eventually, if it touches the ground, the airflow stops, you get a sudden loss of downforce, sudden loss of grip, which gives the driver a big problem in the middle of the corner. The cruel irony is that in the relentless... All right, so the smaller the gap is, this time we have to deal with the constancy of the mass flow rate, right? When you force the air into a smaller opening, it's going to speed up. Yeah, let me just find this. So you're looking at the gap right here. When you force the air into a smaller opening, because of the constancy of the mass flow rate, air is going to speed up under the vehicles. Faster moving air underneath is going to generate a smaller pressure. So there's going to be a huge pressure difference between the top and the bottom. So it's going to increase the downward force. It's going to increase the normal force. It's going to increase the friction. In Thanos' case, right, the gap was so low that obviously the car started to touch the ground. When these guys are negotiating a curve like that, if that gap disappears, the down force is going to vanish. The downforce, which is four times larger, and the weight of the vehicle is going to vanish. So at that point, the car is actually moving far faster than it needs to be in order to negotiate from negotiating a curve. So at that point, you lost control of the vehicle. Exactly 11.0 seconds into Senna's... So that's what happens. ...that something had reduced the ride height of the Williams FW16. Television viewers saw an explosion of sparks, indicating that the car was definitely touching the ground in the middle of one of the fastest corners in all of Formula One. 
What was it that caused the Senna scar to scrape along the ground that day in 1994? In the case of Senna's accident, there was a, a bad incident at the start. So it was decided to start the race behind the safety car. Now, the safety car is just a road car driven at reasonable speed, but way below anything that a racing car would ever do. The race at Imola was only the second time a safety car had been used on a dry track in Formula One. And it played havoc with the cars following behind it. The tires cooled down from their normal hot racing temperatures, causing them to contract. And it was this that caused the drop in the extremely critical ride height. It would normally be just skating, just, just, just touching the ground in those places, on those bumps. Well, of course, with the tire pressures down by maybe 25 percent the movement in the tire was maybe up by four or five millimeters and when the skid which is metallic hits the ground rather than having a huge grip that sticky racing rubber has and is being pointed in the correct direction by the driver you have just it's just like um, a ski so not only had a large amount of downforce been removed from the car by denying the airflow underneath it the car was also resting for this split second only on the metal skids beneath it the car was suddenly unable to generate the grip it needed to make the corner two seconds the back of the car stepped out Ayrton Senna steered into the slide with the lightning reactions of a triple world champion. One tenth of a second later, the front of the car gripped and turned it to the right. The data logger recorded that the brakes were fully on. The car was now slowing down as hard as possible, but Ayrton Senna ran out of road. When all said and done, the really tragic thing about Ayrton's crash was that if it wasn't for one little thing, he would have been able to jump out of the car and walk back to his spare for the restart. And that little thing was that when his car hit the wall, the front wheel was trapped between the wall and the chassis as the suspension collapsed. And as the car skidded along the wall, the wheel trapped between the two just popped up at the wrong moment and hit him in the head. If it wasn't for that, he would have been uninjured. Just over four hours later, Senna died in the hospital. On his return to his native Brazil, he was given a burial in keeping with his status as a national hero. Millions of fans flocked to pay their respects, and his country declared three days of official mourning. The lessons learned from this accident have changed the sport forever, and without a doubt have saved many lives since. Sad. Way Wednesday, Andretti going over 200 miles an hour when he hit debris. On the track, he walked away from this wreckage, but did get checked out at the Pax Hospital. He is unheard. and ready 63 years old, retired from racing, but he was helping his son Michael out by testing a car for his racing team. And Way Wednesday, Andretti going over. All right, so what's going on? Um, for whatever the reason, the air gets underneath. All right, so this circumstance, what's happening is the air is moving faster because the car ended up just, for whatever the reason, the front portion of the car ended up bouncing in the upper direction. So design, all of a sudden, it becomes like an airplane wing. The air is moving faster on top right now, so it's going to lift the car up. Then he got lucky. He could have easily died because of this accident. So the car flips a couple of times. And then it's right side up, and then he keeps on driving. <laughs> it's amazing. All right. Yeah, Chili's had her share of close calls and near misses. Uh, we've seen this one before. One of them was at a race in Minnesota. It's a drag race. She had just come off a good series of runs. It was one of those days when everything seemed to be going smoothly. We were okay, guys, once again, by design, you notice the right height. Right no, right right. You got this small gap here. It's not, it's not like an upside down air. Minnesota, airplane. and. So it's designed to force the air to go faster underneath. The car. To create it difference between the bottom and the top so that at the bottom the pressure is getting much lower okay this wasn't intentional Shelly's up. she pedaled it real fast oh i have to think now about 400 feet out started to smoke the tires and she pedaled it real fast well when she lifted the clutch finished locking up and as she floated it hooked up in the car right over backwards and it was like she didn't have a chance i remember when it went up what i said tuck your thumbs because when it rolls i, I drive like this it'll take my thumbs off so I did. I said, tuck my thumbs and I just put it on the bottom of the steering wheel. And it hit the first time and I went, oh, not bad. <laughs> that was stupid because when it hit the second time, then it hurt. Well, when Shelly had the blowover, I didn't know it, but at that time she had separated some ribs. And because uh, the next day when I was strapping her in a car and I would pull the seatbelts tight, I see her winching a little bit. And I said, problem? Nope, nope, I'm fine. And it wasn't until about a week later I found out if she got home, she went to a doctor and she had separated ribs and stuff. So she's pretty tough. The blowover was caused when Shelly's car lost power. Normally, the tremendous engine thrust keeps the nose of the drag. Right, so once again, this gap underneath is important. Extra. So the air needs to be moving faster underneath. Pin to the ground. So it pins the front to the ground. But when the engine burns out, or in Shelley's case, misfires, the resulting loss of downward air pressure on the nose causes the front of the car to rise. Because the air starts to move faster on top. Producing a backwards catapult, or blowover. So it generates a left. <laughs> Mm. Ah. 
Open the door, airplane door, from inside, obviously, but if you could, you will get sucked out. All right, because of the tremendous pressure difference between inside and outside. Okay, so the inside of the cabin is obviously pressurized. The outside, you're 30,000 feet up, so there's a natural pressure difference. But also, because of the motion of the airplane, the faster the airplane moves, which means that relative to the airplane, the faster the air is moving, that's like 550 miles per hour, the lower the pressure is going to be. So the faster moving air outside is going to generate a lower pressure difference, So which means that there's going to be a huge pressure difference between inside and outside. <laughs> will get sucked out. A couple of years ago, I think the window just, for whatever the reason, exploded and this woman got partially sucked out and they were just trying to, they grabbed her and they were trying to hold her in, except she died. I think she had a heart attack. <laughs> so if a portion of the airplane goes missing and something this happened, obviously, then... Just as important as careful design is proper maintenance of aircraft. Take the Aloha Airline 737 descending for a landing at Honolulu in April of 1988. Suddenly, 18 feet at the top of the plane simply tore off. A flight attendant who was not in her seat was sucked out into the sky. But after an emergency landing, no other lives were lost. Design flaw and a maintenance disaster. Obviously, a design flaw, and what is really sad is other operators and the manufacturer had figured that out. There were actually kits available to go back and retrofit and, and, and check for those things. The problem turned out to be simple metal fatigue associated with the use of aluminum, which is unlike steel in one crucial respect, fatigue life. Aluminum does not have an infinite fatigue life. If I took a bar that took 10,000 pounds to break and I started pulling on it at 2,000 pounds, after a while, it would go, snap, and I would have two pieces. Every time an aluminum passenger jet reaches altitude, it is pressurized inside like a balloon. When it descends, the pressure is released. If this process continues indefinitely without maintenance, sooner or later the balloon bursts. In airplanes, it becomes a concern around 30,000 to 50,000 takeoff and landing cycles. The first thing that happens is that cracks form in the skin. There were a couple people who actually saw the crack, or they boarded, and they just assumed, and I also assumed, that we could just trust that somebody had seen that and the government was doing its job. Only one person lost their life. All right, so the nuclear bombs, the nuclear explosions, or kills. A lot of you guys are mistaken to think that the nuclear bombs are designed to kill through radiation. Not really, guys. If you want to kill through radiation alone, it's called a dirty bomb. Uh, that's one of the worst ways you can kill someone. It's, the nuclear bombs are designed to kill through blast. So what's a blast? One blast is just a shockwave. You try to create a shockwave. In consequence of and this shockwave travels at about 1,000 miles per hour. Sound travels at 773 miles per hour. So the shock tra shockwave travels faster than sound, which means that it's going to push the air out of its way. It's cre it creates a partial vacuum. Under the circumstances, what does that feel like? It feels like you're exposed to the full vacuum of space. So you will experience bends. We actually under the circumstances. So the nice thing of it is, it's, that it's not the bends that's going to kill you, obviously. So what happens is you end up losing consciousness immediately. And obviously, you've got heat wave coming up. You've got tremendous amount of radiation. Several usually, the heat wave ends up killing large all of nuclear them. weapons. And this allowed us to study uh, how air blast waves travel across the surface of Europe. So the air blast is traveling about 1,000 miles per hour. So if you're exposed to it, uh, you will immediately lose consciousness because you will experience the ex extreme form of bends. It's like being exposed to the full vacuum of space. We know. And then you got the heat. Oh, now that you have the light huge explosions create. Temperatures are almost like temperatures at the surface of the sun. It's shockwave. Even hotter. All right, so what happens to the buildings? Faster moving air outside is going to reduce the pressure quite a bit. So inside pressure is about 15 pounds per square inch. Outside pressure is almost, it's, it's zero in essence. So the pressure difference means that the buildings will explode. It's in the ground, followed by hurricane level winds. So that's the travel for tens of miles. Inside pressure is one atmosphere. The outside pressure is nearly zero. Inside pressure is 15 pounds per square inch. Outside mm. pressure is nearly zero because fast moving air is going to lower the pressure to zero or near zero. You end up getting an explosion. Travel for tens of miles. Hurricanes will do the same. Tornadoes will do the same. Buildings will explode. So you got a tornado. Notice that the Oof, it's gone because the faster moving air is going to create a low pressure outside. It's going to be lower than the inside pressure. As a result, the buildings end up losing their roofs or sides, or sometimes the buildings simply explode because of that. All right, so from a mathematical perspective, oh, this is not a fast moving this air. It's 30 miles per hour. It's blowing across the roof of a house. And then, so the density of air is going to be 1.29. All right, so the outside wind is moving at 3,000. 30 miles per hour. Okay, so inside it's not windy. So it's going to be zero. How much of a pressure difference will we have between inside and the outside of the house? Okay, in terms of PSI. So once again, this is the Bernoulli's equation. This is the one that we will get to use. Take a look at the pressure difference between inside and outside. 
Right, so we've done the work already, so I'm kind of cheating at this point. So the inside, the air is not moving on the inside, so it's gonna be zero. All right, so the pressure difference in terms of change in PS pressure per square inch is gonna be marginal, so it's not a big deal. So you're not gonna lose a roof over something like this. All right, so it's a nice little demonstration of it. Okay, so tsunami, every time tsunami hits, there's general flooding and a lot of people end up dying. Even if you are a really good swimmer, even if you're an Olympic swimmer, you're not gonna be able to swim in floodwaters. Here's the reason why. The surging current is threatening to sweep the vehicle downstream and even roll it over. Because of the undercurrents. Floodwaters. The stranded motorists consider bailing out, but before they can act, a man. Okay, so what the guy is doing is incredibly dangerous. And tries waiting so, what makes it so dangerous is not what's happening on this side, what's happening on this side. He doesn't realize, rescue. Well, he realized, but he doesn't understand the significance of what's going on. Because in fact, that there's a car here, the car is going to act like an obstacle. All right. Notice that the car has, the car has an opening underneath. All right. So, which means that it's space underneath the car is going to actually make the water go faster. When the water is forced into a smaller opening, it's going to speed up. That's what it means. All right. So the opening under the car is relatively small compared to the region around the car is. All right. So what's going to happen in this region, which is directed towards the opening under the car, Water is already moving much faster in that direction because the water is just getting sucked underneath. So it's creating a faster moving water current in that direction. This guy can't tell because he's just cutting across in this direction. He doesn't realize that this portion of the water is already moving much faster than the water that he's leaving behind. The stranded motorists consider bailing out, but before they can act. All right, so he just steps into that region where there's a strong current and then immediately he's gonna lose his balance. A man tries waiting to their rescue. All right, so he, that was a huge mistake. The current is much stronger. And he's gonna get sucked right but he's under soon discovers the waters brute. He's still trying to walk. It's, it's gotta find the impossible. Right he gets sucked under. Potentially you could you could die by making a mistake like He that. struggles to reach the car, but the torrent overcomes his heroic effort to help, and soon he can't even help himself. All right, he's not gonna be able to get up under circumstances. He gets lucky. He's gonna go right under the car and come up on the other the side. The man gets sucked underwater and under the car, where he's in danger of being crushed by the ship. And then he gets the vehicle or drowned. It's a heart-stopping moment. Gets but suddenly, the side. he bobs up downstream. Had the man been trapped under the car, he... So, what caused the stronger current, the obstacle, the car being an obstacle, around the obstacles, usually the yeah, fluid is going to speed up. And of course, there's an opening underneath the car. The smaller the opening is, the faster the water is going to move. So, end up creating this faster-moving water current. Almost certainly would have perished. Amazingly, he's still conscious as he surfaces, and two onlookers are able to pull him. All right, so that's one reason why most people end up dying. Safety. Waters, but that's not the major reason. Here's the major reason. Perth, Australia. The Avon River is home to one of the most treacherous canoe races in the world. It's fast, furious, and unforgiving. These turbulent rapids are swirling death trap, so dangerous that they claimed the life of one young competitor earlier in the day. Most racers are so fearful of this hazardous stretch of water, they incur extra time by getting out and carrying their canoes to avoid the danger. But 23-year-old Watlin Mills tries to save a couple of minutes by barreling through the rough rapids. There he is, wearing a helmet. Suddenly, his fight for first place becomes a fight for his life. The force of the current flips Watlin and wedges in between two jagged rocks. Spectators along the shore watch in horror as Lachlan is dragged beneath the surface. <laughs> Rescue diver Tim Moore knows he has to act fast. The only chance he thought of getting out was me, because there's nothing else going to get him out. Tim jumps in, but he can't move. The powerful rapids are holding him back. <laughs> it's so unbelievable. There was nothing we could do. Lachlan's life is slipping away. Tim summons the strength to battle the brutal current, finally reaching the canoe. But I get to the bow and start to lift, and, and it didn't budge. It just didn't budge at all. Robin has not been underwater for more than a minute and a half. Tim has no idea whether he's alive or dead. He's not about to give up. There had been a clock ticking in the back of my mind. I knew that uh, it was all a matter of time. If something can get done very soon, he'd be pulling out a body. Just when all hope seems lost, Lachlan gets a lucky break. An out-of-control racer bumps into his canoe, freeing it from the rocks. Tim pulls Lachlan's head above the water, but he's not breathing. Quickly, Tim and his fellow rescuers begin mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. They pull Lachlan to safety, praying that it's not too late. Full of faith or whatever, but I think uh, Lachlan's time is up. After what seems like an eternity, Lachlan regains consciousness. 
he recalls what went wrong. Shortly after I went over the edge, that's when I started to lose control over the boat. That was when my heart was in my mouth because that was the point of no return. What was everywhere, the realisation was coming to me that, yeah, I could quite easily drown. I quite easily drown here at age 23. Thanks to the courage of rescue diver Tim Moore, Lachlan survived. But he will never again underestimate this river's awesome power. Okay, so a couple of things. What makes this so dangerous? Number one, the water is not that deep. All right, guys, this is knee deep. All right, this is how most people die during flooding. The problem is the obstacles that you're looking at. Around the obstacles, the water is going to speed up. All right, around the obstacles, notice that obstacles offer these gaps to the incoming water. It's smaller the size of the opening, the faster the water is going to go. Also, the deeper you go, the faster the water is going to go because this distance between the openings, the obstacles start to become narrower, right? which means the size of the openings become smaller and smaller. The size of the area of the openings will become smaller and smaller. As a result, the deeper you go, the faster the water moves. The faster the water moves, the smaller the pressure is, So, which means that the deeper you go, the, pressure, the smaller the pressure becomes. So the pressure reduces the deeper you go, So, which means that you're going to end up being sucked, sucked under as a result. So because of all these obstacles, it generates all sorts of currents around the obstacles. Now, of course, uh, because everything is rocking, also the base bed of this river is rocky all over the place. The more the rocks, the larger the number of rocks you have, the faster the water is going to move closer to the riverbed, in essence. And so what happens is, number one, there's a strong undercurrent, so it just turns over. And it's just he's trying his best. Obviously, nothing's happening. And at that point, you get lucky because the other guy comes in and hits him. And this guy goes under. And then somehow he was fine, obviously. And they were able to rescue him. And this is literally almost waist deep. It wasn't that deep in the first place. So he kind of got stuck 